Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. We, so good to see you. It is. We are so glad that you have joined us for this Sunday at the Village. Always blesses us to hear from you and to know that you're gaining something from these uh, services that we're putting on the internet. It makes us very, very happy. Keep those comments coming. We love hearing from you every Sunday. Hey, we are doing something really cool at our house next week. And so if you live in Metro Atlanta and you consider yourselves a part of the village or you like the village or you just want a free meal, come to our house next Tuesday or next Thursday. Not both, just one or the other. And we're going to be kind of talking about the church, reopening the church in September, September the 12th. And what do you have on the menu? What's going to be happening? Oh, it's a secret. It's a secret? It's a secret, but you'll love it. I promise. So, you will love it. So, Coming out of Mama Jane's Kitchen. So. Mama Jane's Kitchen. So you just plan to come. What we'd like you to do is go to the Events on the Village Church Facebook page. And there you'll see a Tuesday night event at our house and a Thursday night event at our house. Please just let us know one of those days. Come to the house, 6.30, dress comfortably. And you'll enjoy a wonderful meal, and then we're just going to talk about church, talk about the future, and just kind of reacquaint ourselves with yes. each other. We'd love get, that. Get prepared for the grand reopening. We also are very excited. We've got work going on at the church even right now. Hopefully, they're not working today. It's Sunday, but but we've had work going on almost every day. And when you walk through the doors, for those who have been with us a while, I think you're going to be really pleased with uh, some of the improvements that we've been able to make in the building. Yes, you are going to be pleased, I promise. So, the other thing I wanted to say is we've gotten great feedback on a series that we started last week called The Happiness Project. And uh, we have two small groups that meet during the week, and one of the small groups, they got in touch with me, and they said, we love this series. We actually did this series a couple of years ago. Do you remember it? I loved it. It was one of my very favorites. And I think Neil had something to do with oh, the writing Neil was, of it. When, Disney. Yeah, Neil not only helped write it, he was the Researching. brain. He's the first one that kind of said, what do you think about this? And it, it does use a lot of science, but it also intersects a lot with the spirituality. And I just think that, that Christianity ought to apply to our, our regular everyday lives. If it's just pie in the sky, then I don't know that that's such a big deal. I think it also should kind of work for us in this life. Can can this life be better? And I think the Happiness Project kind of goes into that. Do you remember any of them that jump out to you that, that were particularly good? Yeah, one of my very favorites was on savoring and gratitude. One of the most important things for me is gratitude because I have a lot of obstacles in my life that I am constantly trying to overcome. And... When you are grateful, that is very, very helpful. And um, actually, each year, for the past several years, I've come up with a word that I like for each year. And last year, my word was just breathe. Well, that's two words. But anyway, and then this year, it's uh, grateful. And we actually say when we sit down to eat, we ask, are we grateful? And so I'm excited about this, the message and hearing uh, all of the science behind uh, the message, and I hope you'll be there with us. You know, I, I totally, it, that was, <laughs> don't roll your eyes, that was incredible. <laughs> One of the things that um, um, the talk today, which is on gratitude and savoring, is going to give you some great insights into ways that you can make your life better, and I hope you'll stick with us. And I do love that grateful thing, because how easy can we just drift off of that? You're going to love it. Would you do us the, the pleasure? Would you say the blessing or the sure. prayer for us? Sure. Thank you. I am grateful I that, I can be, that I'm here, that I can do this. Yeah. Dear Lord, we thank you for the Village Church, and we thank you for the series that we are listening to right now. And we just pray, God, that it will touch a lot of lives that is, it, as it has touched mine. And I pray that people would have open minds and open hearts and open ears to, uh, to listen and to participate and to hopefully make their lives better. We thank you for each person that is a part of the village and a part of making our lives better. And we just thank you for all that you do and just let us have a grateful day. Amen.
There are three ways you can give to the village. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979, 404-998-8979. Or you can go to the website, thevillageatlanta.com slash GIVE. Or you can send a check to the Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive, Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. Now let's learn about happiness with Ray Waters. Earlier this year, Virgin CEO Richard Branson wrote a blog post about happiness. He's often asked, what is the key to success? And this is what he wrote. He said, my answer is always simple, happiness. Happiness should be everyone's goal. Last week, we started this series with, about happiness, and we talked about some misconceptions we all have about what will bring us happiness. Listen, I thought back in my early life how foolish I was on what would make me happy. There was a time in my life I thought if I only had, it was a used red Jaguar, but I thought if I only had that used red Jaguar, it would make me happy. And you know what? It did. For about two weeks, it made me very, very happy. But then the happiness wore off, and I was so dumb, I then thought what I needed was a second Jaguar, and I bought a blue Jaguar with my red Jaguar. And you know how long that made me happy? About two weeks. Because I just didn't understand where real happiness comes from. If you weren't here last week, we talked about all of these things. There's a video, there's the audio of the message. It's all on the Village website at thevillageatlanta.com slash happy. So I want you to go there, and if you missed it, I want you to catch up. It's 22 minutes. It'll be easy to catch up. I want you to see that. Here's some things we learned last week. Without an active happiness practice, our happiness levels remain fairly constant our whole life. In other words, science says 50% of your happiness is set to, according to your DNA. You don't do anything I'm going to suggest in this course, this kind of uh, series that we're going through. 50% of your happiness is totally determined by your DNA. Some people are normally happier than others. Some people are a little sadder than others. But that doesn't change. So if you have a happy experience, you buy the Jaguar, use Jaguar, you get happy for two weeks, but then you go right back down to the level that you've always been at. You get a new house, you go up, but you come right back down to the level you've always been at. If you don't put into your practice... Uh, some of these happiness uh, lessons we're going to be talking about. A second thing we talked about last week is without an active happiness practice, we are remarkably bad at understanding what will or will not make us happy. We as human beings are clueless, left to our own designs, we are clueless about what truly makes us happy people. We imagine more money or a better job or reaching a major goal or having better stuff or finding true love, or getting a perfect body will make us happy. But the latest research demonstrates at best, any of those things only offer a temporary bump in happiness, and then we level off. Last week, we largely spent time on what doesn't work. This week, and I'm happy, we turned the corner this week and then for the next several weeks, we're going to be learning about what social scientists and psychologists are finding really does improve happiness over the course of a lifetime. These are things that really, really work. And you know what's amazing? As we looked at the scientific literature to prepare this series, we were blown away by how much recent scientific research fits perfectly with the pure and simple lessons that Jesus taught. Jesus called it life in the kingdom. And life in the kingdom really is a happier, more joy-filled way to live. This is a journey we all need to be on. It really is an important part of all of us living our best lives. In that blog post I mentioned earlier written by Richard Branson, he shared a letter to a stranger with his advice on happiness. I thought it was wise. Dear stranger, so many people get caught up in doing what they think will make them happy, but in my opinion, this is where they fail. Happiness is not about doing, it's about being. In order to be happy, you need to think consciously about it. Don't forget the to-do list, but remember to write a to-be list. If you allow yourselves to be in the moment and appreciate the moment, happiness will follow. I speak from experience. 
We built a business empire, joined conversations about the future of our planet, attended many memorable parties, and met many unforgettable people. And while these things have brought me great joy, it's the moments that I stopped just to be rather than do that have given me true happiness. Why? Because allowing yourself just to be puts things into perspective. Try it. Be still. Be present. For me, it's watching the flamingos fly across Necker Island at dusk. It's holding my new grandchildren's tiny hands. It's looking up at the stars and dreaming of seeing them up close one day. It's listening to my family's dinner table debates. It's a smile on a stranger's face, the smell of rain, the ripple of a wave, the wind across the sand. It's the first snowfall of winter and the last storm of summer. There's a reason we're called human beings and not human doings. As human beings, we have the ability to think, move, and communicate in a heightened way. We can cooperate, understand, reconcile, and love. That's what sets us apart from most other species. Don't waste your human talents by stressing about nominal things or that which you cannot change. If you take the time simply to be and appreciate the fruits of life, your stresses will begin to dissolve and you will be happier. But don't just seek happiness when you're down. Happiness shouldn't be a goal. It should be a habit. Take the focus off doing and start being every day. Be loving, be grateful, be helpful, and be a spectator to your own thoughts. Allow yourself to be in the moment and appreciate the moment. Take the focus off everything you think you need to do and start being. I promise you, happiness will follow. Happy regards, Richard Branson. Social scientists and psychologists have a word for what Richard Branson wrote about in that letter. It's not a technical word, it's a word that you'll recognize because it's a word that we have associated with food for so many of us. The word I want you to get this morning is savoring. When we savor something, we relish it. We enjoy it. We delight in it. We revel in it. We luxurate in it. We bask in it. Now, by temperament, I struggle with savoring. I know this by how I naturally eat. I eat very fast. Anybody else eat very fast by nature? And I, we, it's not like I get it when people say, yeah, we were a starving family, and if I didn't eat the chicken, somebody else get the chicken. We weren't a starving family. I just ate fast. When Jane and Neil are sitting at the table, they both are foodies, and they are great cooks, and they savor. Joe, they taste things in food I have never tasted in food because it just goes straight into my stomach. I don't even know what it is. They'll say, is that garlic or is that fennel that I'm tasting? It's like, fennel? What is fennel? I don't even know what fennel is. No, I think it's rosemary that I'm tasting, just a hint of rosemary. They savor every little bite. I have finished my meal. They're still talking about the first bite. It's like, come on, come on, what are are y'all doing? But I'm working on this because savoring is important with food. It's important with drink. But it's really, really important if you want to live a happy life. The psychologist Fred Bryant and Joseph Veroff chose to use the word savoring to explain this thing we can do that legitimately increases happiness. In the same way that we learn to cope with negative experiences so we can survive them, we also can learn to savor positive experiences so we can thrive based on them. According to Bryant and Veroff, savoring is the process of attending to, appreciating, and enhancing positive experiences. And then they say this, savoring is a second-order experience, and what that means is It means it's an intentional higher level experience that requires your mindfulness. You have to cultivate mindfulness. It's what happens when we mentally check in with what's happening at any given moment 
and we actively think about the experience. Occasionally, an experience is so good we can't go to bed without automatically savoring that experience. But really, those experiences are rare. More frequently, we have wonderful experiences in life without stopping and reflecting on what made that meal, that time with friends, that song, that vacation, that book, that play, that movie, what made those things so special? If we want to be happier, we have to develop a happiness practice, and that starts with cultivating a habit of savoring those special moments of goodness that we experience in life. A few years ago, I attended a three-day seminar in Laguna Beach. The featured speaker was a Franciscan priest by the name of Richard Rohr. I had read several of his books, but for three days, I sat just a few feet from him, and I listened and hung on every word that he said. One of the things that I've never forgotten from that session was that he talked about savoring. Here's what he said. He said there's a psychologist named Dan O'Grady who had recently attended one of Rohr's seminars, and he shared this with Rohr. Rohr's then passing it on to us. Rohr said, important, y'all, are negative and critical thoughts they are like Velcro. When a negative or critical thought goes through our mind, it sticks and it holds. Whereas our positive and joyful thoughts are much more like Teflon, they slide off. Negative thoughts stick. Positive thoughts have a tendency to be like Teflon and just fly off. He said, you have to deliberately choose to hold on to positive thoughts so they can imprint. Observing my own habits about this, um, I see it's true. I can remember, Joe, I can remember as a young preacher, someone meeting me at the back door and being critical after a sermon about one little minor point, being critical, and I can tell you the person's name. I can tell you exactly what they were wearing. That's nearly 40 years ago. I can tell you everything about that person and then I try to think of the people who meant the most to me in that church, the kind, sweet ladies and men who were so good to a young preacher just getting started, have a hard time remembering them. But I remember negative sticks like Velcro, positive like Teflon. The implications are enormous for all of us in this place. If you will get that one thought, it can change your life. Rohr went on to say this. Neuroscience can now demonstrate the brain indeed has a negative bias. The brain prefers to constellate around fearful, negative, or problematic situations. Can I say that again? The brain prefers to constellate around fearful, negative, or problematic situations. In fact, when a loving, positive, or unproblematic thing comes your way, you have to savor it consciously for 15 seconds before it can harbor and store itself in your implicit memory. In other words, if you don't focus on that positive thought, if you don't focus on that beautiful picture you're looking at, if you don't focus on that precious smile or that kind word, if you don't focus on that for 15 seconds, it won't lodge. It's gone. It just went through. Negative thought, it'll stay. Positive thought, gone. We must indeed savor the good in order to significantly change our regular attitudes and moods. You have to learn this or you're stuck. And you can learn it. And you also need to strictly monitor all the Velcro negative thoughts because they will destroy you. Now, there's two kinds of savoring. There is world-focused savoring and then there is self-focused savoring. Let me talk just a moment about this. World-focused savoring involves experiences that connect me to something bigger than me, things outside of me. It could be an experience that I have in nature. You ever walked along the beach and just been kind of overwhelmed at how beautiful things are and the, the majesty and marvel of the ocean? Uh, that would be savoring when you think about those things. That's savoring something that's in nature. Changing of the colors of the leaves in the fall. It could be an interaction with a person. Have you ever listened to an artist sing or play an instrument and you're just kind of, you, you just savor it. It's like that's unbelievable. 
It could be a group of people that you're around. You just kind of savor it. It could be spiritual. It could be a supernatural experience. Those are things outside of yourself that you just savor. Self-focused savoring involves experiences that connect me to something within me. It includes things like my talents, hard work, personality, behavior, and even things associated with my physical uh, body. Occasionally, I will write something, and I'll go back later and say, that was, real, that was good. That was good. The way that came out, that was really good. That would be savoring something that I did. Um, I, occasionally, I'll put a party together. And, of course, Jane makes everything lovely, but I'll invite different groups of people. And just sometimes the mix of people is just lovely. And I'll, at the end of it, think, that was a really, that was nice. That was really nice. That's savoring. A focused, hard day's work. Jane, I don't, I don't do this, but Jane will go out and she'll work all day in the yard. And she just loves that. And I think, that's hell to me. I can't even imagine wanting to do that. I mean, that would be horrible. But she'll go out and she'll do it. And she comes in and she is dirty from head to toe. And she says, I, that's... That was awesome. It's like, you're a weirdo to me. I just can't even imagine that. You ever had an interaction with someone that was so meaningful and it was, and it was just helpful to them and you just, it's okay to step back and just savor that you did something, that it was you. You were able to participate in that. Self-focused savoring requires some balance. Hear me, you don't want to brag about everything that's great about you. But it is important when you can accomplish a goal or victory and you can look back in reflection on how you made it happen. That's a good thing. Too often we make the mistake of pulling off a beautiful accomplishment and then immediately we get busy moving on to the next thing. I've done that. You do something and it's good and then you begin something immediately. You start doing something else and you never stopped to just breathe and savor what just happened. There's another kind of self-focused savoring that's my favorite. Bryant and Veroff call it luxurating. I love that word, luxurating. It's perhaps the easiest type of savoring for us to understand. It's what we do on vacation and when we experience beautiful art or the glory of nature. Those things are outside of ourselves, but when we luxurate, we take that beauty into ourselves. You know what I'm talking about? It just kind of comes in and you just feel enlarged because of what you have just witnessed. It's a beautiful thing. I think it's that way in worship, actually. When I see people really enter into a sense of worship in church, it's not hyper-emotionalism. That's what some people think, that it's hyper-emotionalism. I think more than that, it is them focusing on the words that they are singing and focusing on the sense that there is a God who loves us, who is for us, not against us. And, and as they focus on that and as they stand and they sing those songs, they take that into themselves and you see them enlarged by the very process. The song Jacob sang this morning, I just focused on those words, alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin. But your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Can anybody relate to what that felt like when you just felt like you were just a prisoner to your own silliness, foolishness, shame? Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began. I just think when I sing those songs and I really try to savor it, it comes inside and it enlarges my life. These are not just phenomenal moments we're talking about. We're talking also about just everyday moments that you need to think about and savor. Let me give you some ideas for how you can savor things, all right? The first is this. Have a conversation with someone about an experience and how it made you feel. 
I asked Jane when she came in. She came in. She, she didn't come up to sit by me till right at, right at the end of the music set. And I said, is everything okay? And she said, you know, I just found myself watching Jim Baum greet people at the door. And just the way he hugged them, she said, it just, I just watched. I just watched. Now, many of us could walk by that every day. But she stopped and she savored it. And she told me about it. You can spend time thinking about how fortunate or lucky or blessed you were to get to have such a beautiful experience. She can this afternoon think about that experience and that will allow her to continually live in that savoring moment. The other day I went outside and was just sitting in the backyard, which is not common for me, but I just went out and sat in the backyard and uh, then it started raining and so I moved under the carport and I was just, I was trying to practice this. I was trying to, because my nature, right, I, I just go right past it. But I was trying to just think about how beautiful it was. Then the biggest rainstorm came up. Y'all remember the other night? It just, just hit so fast. But I was under the carport and so it was like, I was just thinking about how beautiful this was and flowers are being nourished and the grass is being nourished and then lightning flashed and thunder followed and I ran into the house so fast I thought this is crazy I ain't saving no more I'm scared to death I want to be in my house but just for a moment I was able to savor and it was really nice free yourself to get lost emotionally or physically in an experience just get lost in it forget your schedule for just a moment and just watch just enjoy Allow yourself to be proud of the part you played in making the experience happen. If you're a part of the experience, then it's okay to be proud and think that was a good thing I was able to do. Be fully present in the moment. That's mindfulness. Be fully present in the moment. Don't be checking your Facebook. Don't be looking past this person to see the person in the back that you're wondering what they're doing. Be present. Be present. That's one thought we wanted you to get is savoring. Big deal, savoring. Next thought I want you to get is gratitude, which is different, but it's super important if you're going to really be serious about happiness. The second practice of happiness is gratitude. Gratitude is a practice that naturally follows a healthy practice of savoring. So if you savor, it will roll right into gratitude quite easily. Dr. Robert Emmons is a professor of psychology at the University of California who has focused his work on the subject of gratitude for over 20 years. His research shows physical, psychological, and social benefits of practicing gratitude. In other words, gratitude makes you a happier, healthier person. Dr. Emmons says gratitude has two components. It's an affirmation of goodness. Gratitude says we acknowledge that there is good in the world and we have received gifts and benefits from it. And then the second part is life's goodness has a source that is outside of us. Life gives us good things we don't necessarily earn or deserve. For those of us that are followers of Jesus, we would say we humbly accept our connectedness to each other and to God. That's a part of gratitude. Just like savoring, gratitude is also a second-order experience, which means it has to be intentional. It just doesn't happen. It has to be intentional. Gratitude allows us to deal with the very real fact that blessings we receive are above and beyond what we have given in this life. If we were serious about gratitude, what we receive way, way, way is more than what we ever give. The Christian writer G.K. Chesterton had the right idea when he said we need to get into the habit of taking things with gratitude, not taking things for granted. Don't take things for granted. Take things with gratitude. Take things with gratitude. Gratitude puts everything in a fresh perspective. It enables us to see the many blessings all around us, and the more ways we find to give thanks, the more things we find to be grateful for. Giving thanks does take practice, though. We get better at it over time, and gratitude is one of the key markers of a spiritual life. A few years ago, my wife, Jane, was going through a time of depression and anxiety. She wasn't feeling happy as much as she was used to. Jane did a study, and then she shared this study with the group of ladies in our church. It was called 1,000 Gifts, and it was written by Ann Voskamp. Let me quickly summarize the book for you. Voskamp's story begins with the twin themes of suffering 
and ingratitude. She recounts the heartbreaking story of the death of her sister and shows how this, along with other great sorrows and disappointments, drove gratitude far from her life. 1,000 Gifts is her biographical account of first seeing her need for gratitude and then learning to express it not in spite of life's trials, but even through life's trials. And she refers to this as the Eucharistio, Eucharist is the word for Thanksgiving in the Greek language. So she called it her Eucharistio, her way to show thanks. And it was just ordinary things. It was ordinary things. The first three things she lists in her thousand gifts were morning shadows across old floors. That was number one. Jam piled high on toast. Jam piled high on toast. That was two. The cry of a blue jay from a high spruce tree. That was number three. As she writes, she finds that she begins to think and speak a language of gratitude. Her life is transformed as she discovers how to be grateful. She goes so far as to make this very nearly sacramental saying. I love this. If clinging to his goodness is the highest form of prayer, then seeing his goodness with a pen or with the shutter camera or with a word of thanks, these really are the most sacred acts conceivable we can ever do. Jane took this to heart. She began writing things she was grateful for every day. I asked her if I could bring this today. This is 1,000 gifts. Every morning I would come down for coffee and I would see my wife sitting in her chair and she would be writing things she was grateful for. Some of them are funny. Some of them are serious. They're all just life. Being retired, that's one she was grateful for. Being able to pick up Trevor, her grandson, when he had a nosebleed at school because of where we live and her schedule, she was able to go pick him up and bring him home. She counted that as a gift. Robert Ware in our church, working a camera. Robert Ware, volunteering to do the Kroger run on Sunday mornings. It's right here on the list. That was something she was grateful for. Getting to go to the women's rally, the march, the women's march. She wrote that as something that she was grateful for. On one of these, I remember seeing um, Trevor stop cussing. He's five years old. That was good. (laughs) I don't know the full details behind that, but I'm really glad that Trevor stopped cussing. Jenna taking her Nana to the doctor. Water, running water from a spigot. What a luxury we get to enjoy every day. Visiting Ray and Jen and the California kids. Double dating with Brandon and Jenna. Casual date night for Ray's birthday going to a Braves game, riding in the way back of Stephen Kelly's Suburban, seeing daisies growing, my incredibly sexy husband. (laughs) I made that one up, but I think I I looked all the way, I looked all the way through here. It's not in the dang deal, so, but I just appreciate so much. That better be 1,001. (laughs) My point is, my heart feels so much love when I read that, and I know it helped Jane as she just looked at every, that's why she saw Jim today, and she's, because she's trained herself now. It's not just the busyness of the lobby on Sunday morning, it's Jim hugging people as they come through the first door into our church, that's a beautiful thing. The people working in the cafe in the morning, that's a beautiful thing. The people that do things around here, it's a beautiful thing. The kind word said by the person who's sleeping outside, but the kind word they said about how they feel about our church, that is a beautiful thing. She is practicing gratitude. Love is the root of being grateful. Love is at the root of being grateful. There's a story in the Bible of 10 lepers coming to Jesus and asking him to heal them. 
And Jesus did heal them. He told them, you go, your, go show yourselves to the priest now, which was legally what they needed to do. You're, and as they were going, the Bible says they were healed. But Luke chapter 17 says this, one of them, there's 10 healed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And then Luke writes, and he was a Samaritan. Ten were healed, only one was grateful. Someone who was a minority, hated by the Jews, he had been ostracized even further. Not only was he a Samaritan, but he had leprosy, yet he was the grateful one. The others just did the rules, went to the priest, but he was grateful. Episcopal priest Barbara Brown Taylor in her beautiful sermon on this text agrees that the nine were fulfilling expectations and doing their duty by obeying the law. She writes that nine behaved like good lepers, good Jews. Only one, a double loser, behaved like a man in love. She thinks then about how hard she tries to fulfill expectations and obey rules and be a good church-going person like so many of us. And she said this, I know how to be obedient, but I do not know how to be in love. I know how to be obedient but I do not know how to be in love. This is so important. Cicero said gratitude is the parent of all virtues. Gratitude. Is it hard? It is. I believe it's impossible to be happy, though, without learning how to be grateful for this life. Let me give you some ideas about ways to show your gratitude. First thing I want to say is this, express your gratitude in a note or a phone call to a person you love who has made a difference in your life. I don't know if you've heard of the website Soul Pancake. It's a website or webpage run by video producers out of Nashville who make videos to encourage people and bring positivity into the world. You maybe have seen the kid president. That's one of the videos that they've done. Well, I recently watched a video where random people were brought in and they were given a happiness test, just like the test that we're asking you to take. They were given a happiness test. Then they were asked to name a person who has influenced them the most in their life, and then they were asked to write down why they were grateful. In other words, what has that person done in your life that has made such an impact? What has that person really meant to you? And then they did this. Thank you, Jessica. We are going to have to have you call your mother. So who is that right person for you? person is my sister, Erica. We're going to give Erica a call. <laughs> okay. Who would you end up picking? friend of mine, uh, Craig Ains. Her name is Dora. My college accounting instructor. Really? Mm -hmm. Is this somebody you're still in touch with today? No, I'm assuming that he's passed on. That's, that's a <laughs> shame. To the great beyond. You up for it? Um, uh, yes. What would you say if we called up Dora? Oh, well, we can try, but she lives in Britain. In Britain? Oh, no, never by heart, dude. This is awful. That's fine. I don't know my mom's number by heart. If it's true that uh, those who are going on are looking down on us, maybe he read my shit and scratch. Hey, sweetheart. Hey, how you doing? Um, yeah. You got a second? Where you at? In a hotel? I am. I'm in the hotel. Uh huh. You scared me when you asked if I had no. a second or something was wrong. No, I'm on this. I'm on like this little TV show, and they told me to talk about the person that influenced me the most, and I picked you, and then and they're making uh -huh. me call. They're making me call you. Oh, wonderful! Hi, you reached Craig. I'm not here right now. At the tone, please record your message. No, oh, come on. <laughs> Hello? Hi. Hi. Erica, it's me. All right, so I got to read you this paragraph. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead, All right. sweetheart. All right, the person that influenced me the most would be my mother, Marlo Dawson. She is a single mother of two. She is a very hard worker and dedicated to her family. Hey, Craig, this is Loie. Um, this is going to be a funny little voicemail, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm so sorry for calling you at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I have to read this to you, okay? And you can't say anything or, I don't know, 
you can respond, but I probably will just keep going. <laughs> okay? Is everything okay? Yes, but I have to read this out loud to you. The person who has had the biggest impact on my life outside of Jesus Christ, who is responsible for my existence, was my college accounting instructor. He had a joy and enthusiasm for his job like no other teacher I have ever known. I love her to death and she keeps me going with positive talk. She is a woman that knows what she wants and won't give up until it is achieved. Oh, it sounds good. I first met Craig on an independent feature film set in Whitefish, Montana. I recently have been sending Craig a lot of positive thoughts as he's suffered a series of health problems. Despite his medical problems, he's continued to work and take pleasure in the small things in life, like sitting quietly with, with his wife Janine on the porch. Erica is my older sister and my best friend. <laughs> Sometimes it even feels like we are twins. She's my number one fan and my number one supporter. She makes me happy because despite all my mistakes and my decisions, she still loves me no matter what. Your friendship is everything. And you are, you are one of the most important person in my life. Even when she has a kid and many children, I will love her more than her kids. Okay, maybe not. I will never forget when she flew 3,000 miles at the drop of a phone call to save me from a breakup. I'm being blessed by having a son like you. I love you. Bye. Why did you do that to me? <laughs> I don't know because they made me do it. <laughs> Thank you for picking up. Bye, sweetie. And then they're like, here, you're going to write this letter. And then I wrote like this whole long ass letter, which, you know, I like don't write. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, guess what? Now we're going to call her and you're going to read her this letter. And I was like, what the f <laughs> Before we let them go, we gave our subjects one more happiness test. Now we mixed up and rephrased the questions so they didn't know they were taking the same test twice. For those who took the time to actually write something down but couldn't make the phone call for whatever reason, we saw happiness increase between 2 and 4%. Good, but not exactly mind-blowing. Now for those who actually picked up the phone and personally expressed their gratitude, we saw increases between 4 and 19%. So either way, expressing your gratitude will make you a happier person. But you want to know something really interesting? The person who experienced the biggest jump in happiness was the least happy person who walked in the door. What does that mean? That means if you're having a particularly tough time, trying this out will more likely have a greater impact on you. Trust me, I'm in a lab coat. Did you like that? I thought that was a very touching thing. Let me quickly give you some more ways to show uh, your gratitude. You need to these are things that I've found helpful. Some of these I've not tried, but many of these I'm beginning to try. Take time to enjoy something you own, but you have ignored. Maybe it's a piece of jewelry or a flower vase, but express your gratitude for its beauty by dusting it off and using it. Maybe a beautiful serving dish or something that maybe has been in the cabinet, but you pull it out and you, you use it. Go on a quiet, meditative walk through your house. Stop and say prayers of thanks for all the good experiences you have had in each room. I have a den, which is my favorite room in the house. There's a piano there, and we sing around the piano. And so I just tried yesterday just to sit there for a few moments and thank God for that room and all the joy that has been experienced in that room. While you're eating a meal, be grateful for the food by savoring each piece with all your senses. I'm working on that one. I got to go a lot. I got to get a little work on that one. Choose one thing that you use every day. I was thinking about Jane, maybe a, a cooking pot or something, and then say a prayer over it, acknowledging how it helps you serve others. And uh, she certainly serves others. Wash your car or maybe clean your phone and tell God how much you appreciate these things and how they help you connect with other people. Show your gratitude for the gifts of nature. This, this would be artsy, crafty people here, I would imagine. By incorporating some of these things, leaves, twigs, acorns, rocks, sand, into a table centerpiece, just plan to go out and pick up those things and put it into something that would remind you. 
I like this one. I don't have pets, but I thought this was good. Convey to your pets how grateful you are to have their company in your daily life. Pass on a gift that you received, but that's sitting unused in a closet. Instead of allowing it just to sit unused, pass it on to someone. Keep gifts in circulation as a sign of gratitude. Write a letter to a relative in which you acknowledge the special role he or she plays in your family circle. If possible, include an invitation to an upcoming meal. Say grace before your meal. Over the last several years, Jane and I had come to a point where we were kind of tired of the Lord bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies to your service. Amen. We were tired of that prayer because it just seemed like it was a ritual. And so what we began to say is, are you blessed? And she would say, I'm blessed. And I would say, thank you, Lord. And we would eat. But that became a ritual too. So now we're trying to mix it up and we are trying to often say grace before the meal by giving thanks for the food, the people who are with us, the presence of the Spirit among us, but to really mean what we are saying. And I think that's important. Is it hard for you to imagine why this really makes people happier? For this to work, though, you can't just hear it. You have to do it. If you just go home and say, that Jane Waters put down a thousand things she was glad of or grateful for, that doesn't get it. If you go home and you say every morning, I'm going to sit down and over my coffee, I'm going to list one, two, or three things that I'm grateful for and really think about it and try to savor it, then there's a chance this will make you a happier person. That's my assignment to you is to take one, or three, one to three things every day and just put it on a tablet or in your computer, run a list, and just over the next weeks of this series, see if you can't come up with 50 things that you're grateful for. Last Sunday, a really good friend of mine died. He was in a car wreck on Saturday morning. His name's Mitch Sneed. He was an uh, editor of... Uh, group of newspapers in Alabama, but he had been a big newspaper star in Georgia, and now he's had big reach in Alabama, uh, hired me to write a column. I write a column for his newspapers, and it was in a bad wreck on Saturday, and he died on Sunday, 57 years old. So Jane and I, we experience things like that a lot. I know you do too. And you know what we said to each other this week? We said, you know what? Life does offer punches in the stomach, horrible experiences, things that just we hate, but also there's so much good. Let's do our best to never apologize for the good blessings in this life. Let's see if we can't focus on that above all. We know there's gonna be bad stuff happens, that's what happens in life, bad stuff always happens. But we can focus on the bad stuff and become cynical and negative and, and pitiful. Or we can make up our minds to focus on what's good. That's what we want. We want to go overboard on learning how to be happier people. I want to close with one more quote. This is my favorite quote of the week. It's by Hetty Cover from Yale University. But this is what I'm talking about. This quote sums it up. A lot of people think of happiness as a very, very exciting emotion. They expect it to be this constant state of ecstasy as opposed to equanimity, which is a more sustainable and attainable form of happiness, almost like a quiet joy. She goes on to say, it doesn't look like winning the lottery. It looks much more like sitting quietly and noticing that your life is actually wonderful. And if we noticed, I think we would see our lives are actually wonderful.